What are some of the research focus areas in your lab? Overall, my lab studies at multiple different levels, a molecular level, a synaptic level, a cellular level, and what we term a circuit level. I started out by asking the question of how powerful substances, such as drugs with addictive liability, drugs such as cocaine, drugs such as opioids, which have gotten so much attention recently, how they modify the neuron to neuron connections, what we term synapses, in highly specific parts of the brain that work from other investigators strongly suggested were important for mediating some of the pathological consequences of these drugs. And in fact, the parts of the brain that are modified to lead to addiction. So we started out by looking at the synaptic changes and that led to studying drugs that may have powerful effects on social interactions, such as MDMA, which was part of the talk I gave to today about the, the great excitement in many different communities, the psychiatric community, the entrepreneur community about the potential therapeutic um, efficacy of drugs that we as a society have previously stigmatized and actually made illegal, such as MDMA, such as psilocybin. You were very early to the game, 20 years ago, thinking about this. What were the, the outside of the domain influences on you that made you be the person to start there? I think the obvious answer is I was trained as a clinical psychiatrist. Um, I actually ran a clinic in, in San Francisco part-time in the early stages of my career. I, start, I stopped doing that because my science was really taking off and I was always wondering about do these mechanisms I'm studying at a very reductionistic level, do they first do they really happen in the intact awake behaving brain and how might this understanding help us advance the understanding of pathological conditions and actually it sounds a little high-minded, impact human health and human well-being mm -hmm. and human experience. And what you just said there is you, you weren't interested just in studying these things in lab rats, you actually mm -hmm. wanted to study in humans. The truth is I personally don't study it in humans, but I wanted to do generate concepts and findings that might influence my colleagues who are doing human research. So to get back to your earlier question, um, actually a long time ago, it's a little scary, 30 years ago, I started thinking that drugs were very po powerful probes of nervous system function and I was studying these mechanisms of synaptic plasticity in the context of learning and memory, and I appreciate it that trying to see whether these changes at synapses were happening in a mouse brain or a rodent brain following some learning and memory task was gonna be very difficult because the way we encode new information like memories, it's highly distributed. It's, it's, it's distributed among thousands, millions of different neurons, and it was just gonna be very difficult. So to, to cut to the chase, I just had the, what I think is the obvious intuition that drugs, and in particular, I started with drugs of abuse for a reason I'll tell you about, especially when administered to, uh, you know, a volunteer mouse or rat. It's just a very powerful experience and it might be much easier to get into that mouse's or rat's brain and look at the types of changes that are occurring um, as a consequence of that powerful drug experience, that it would just be easier to find that. And that furthermore, I started with drugs of abuse like cocaine and morphine and nicotine because from behavioral work, it, w it was clear where you should be looking. And I started looking in this classic parts of the brain that we believe are part of a circuitry we call the reward circuitry, the part of the brain that tells us something feels good when it does feel good and is not activated when something feels bad. And I was able to go in and just show that drugs with addictive liability modify this reward circuitry and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then that got me thinking that drugs such as MDMA, and perhaps I haven't studied drugs in my own lab yet, such as psilocybin, can also be used to probe other aspects of the circuit basis of brain function because drugs have molecular targets 
uh, which means once you understand, you can figure out what the critical molecular targets are that are mediating some behavioral or psychological consequence. And then with all the modern tools of neuroscience, um, tools such as optogenetics and viral tracing of circuits and all sorts of different ways you can observe brain activity and manipulate it. Once you knew the molecular target, you could get into, uh, a, in this case, a rodent's brain and really start trying to delineate how that specific drug is mediating its powerful behavioral effects. As you move from a rodent brain to a human brain, one mm -hmm. thing that you touched in on in your presentation at Brain Mind, which was so fascinating, was the challenges in doing a true random, randomized controlled mm -hmm. trial. Right. It's hard for the, for the subject yeah. not to know that they're getting not a placebo. Mm -hmm. um, you, you shared with us some of the, the techniques that researchers are using. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question and it's a challenging problem. So when you're, you think about doing clinical trials, that is trials in human beings with some of these substances, they, they have very powerful effects. Uh, and there, there is the concern, especially when you're looking for therapeutic efficacy, that what's known as an expectancy bias may actually influence the outcome of that trial. So to do the most rigorous, best kind of clinical trial, you, it, it behooves the researcher to try to have a comparator substance that the subject can't really tell whether it's the, the drug that you are actually testing for its efficacy versus some other substance. For drugs which are, you know, equally fascinating and for some people more fascinating, such as the hallucinogen, psilocybin LSD. Mm -hmm. that, that becomes a very challenging component of designing a rigorous and sophisticated clinical research trial. But nevertheless, I think to do it well and properly, it behooves the investigator to do the best they can. And that could be even something as simple as using lower doses and comparing it to the higher hallucinogenic dose, where the person may feel a little bit of a change in their psychic structure, but not quite as severe, but they're just not gonna be sure. Um, or you could, you could imagine many other ways of trying to get around this issue. Fascinating. Um, so I, I, th yeah, I think that the important thing is just do the, do the best job you can in the most ethical and scientifically rigorous way possible. How do you see the world as being different five, 10, 20 years as these trials get out? My hope is in 10 or 20 years, um, a clinic that is treating these patients, and I'm being careful here because it may be a traditional office of a psychiatrist, it may involve telepsychiatry, it may involve working with mobile apps, but that the, the person responsible for delivering the care is gonna have a armamentarium of tools to help that patient. It may be pharmacotherapies with some of the drugs we were talking about. It may be neuromodulation techniques with some sort of portable device that is sitting in the person's ear or the person's finger. It will certainly involve mobile technology for improving the um, Communica the, the communication between the caregiver and the patient and monitoring the efficacy of the therapy. I hope we are living in a more empathic and compassionate society because of the activities that organizations like Brain Mind initiate it. This is not your first Brain Mind mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. How do you, you go to a lot of conferences, I'm sure. How do you, how would you, <laughs> yes, how do you do. perceive this one as different to other this events is, you go to? I mean, it, this is so much fun. It is dramatically different because, the, as you, you are aware, the traditional scientific conference, by definition, you are interacting with other investigators, other scientists, you share a language, but you're all kind of focused on the research topic of that specific scientific conference, and you're just not worried about the outside world. And most importantly, the major difference is you're not thinking about the impact your science can have on society. Whereas a conference like this is, is fantastic because it brings together people like me who most of the time, until recently, are, are just sitting in their labs trying to do great science, but not thinking at a sufficiently intense level about how their scientific findings may have an impact on society. And you're, so you're bringing people like me and then 
exposing them to investors and entrepreneurs and people from other disciplines, such as the tech sector, such as certain sectors of healthcare delivery. Um, and there's an energy that starts happening where you start listening to what they're doing and they start listening to what you're passionate about. And when things really click, with, it's wonderful because you just start having these dialogues. So for me, uh, I hope to be invited to this for the rest of my life. I hope to be an active participant because I've just met so many smart, interested, and most importantly, passionate people who want to make a difference. And I think in today's world, that's what we need. We can't leave it to our political leaders, unfortunately. Um, and this is a community of people that the founders of Brain Mine are beginning to build where I think that's really gonna be it's great. able to be accomplished.